Welcome to the Way Church Service at Greystone with Pastor John. We invite you to join us at One Oakley Avenue in North Providence, Rhode Island. This podcast is presented to you by The Way Ministries, supported by listeners like you. For donations, live videos, podcasts, and more, please visit www.thewayministriesri.org. Thank you and have a great day. Good morning, Greystone. Good morning. All right, you know how we're going to start this, right? We're going to get a beautiful smile out of everybody, especially the mothers today. A lot of beautiful mothers here. I want to wish you all a happy Mother's Day. I'm grateful. So welcome to the Way Service at Greystone. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this morning to get a portion of God's Word. First and foremost, I'd like to give glory to our risen Savior this morning. Amen. Thank you, Jesus, for making all this possible for us by going to the cross, shedding your blood for the forgiveness of our sins, and becoming this final sacrifice for our sins so we can have a new life, eternal life, spiritual life, and a new purpose here on planet Earth for all who believe in the one and only Son of God. We gather here to learn about our Creator and find our purpose here and use it to glorify God and to serve our Lord and Savior and one another. Our goal, this ministry has a goal, and that is to grow spiritually and start to handle life God's way, not our way. God's word, which is the Bible, becomes the owner's manual to our lives. And we study it, learn it, use it, and apply it to see how God wants us to think, how to live, how to act, how to serve, and how to treat ourselves and others. Thank you, Jesus. Each part of his body is very precious to God. One body many parts. And I personally welcome all of you to the way. We depend on God's grace, not our own power, to accomplish his will for our lives. I also want to say hello to our family are watching on the live feed who can't be here with us this morning. I wish you all a happy Mother's Day, the Mother's Day. And if you can't be with us to worship in the spirit together this morning, and if you would consider supporting our ministry, if the ministry is blessing you, thank you all and thank you for your continued support. And if you have a cell phone, can you please silence it so it doesn't disturb this morning's service? And we will start with a word of prayer. Dear Lord Jesus, Abba Father, thank you for giving us this beautiful day and this beautiful opportunity to gather together as your family to worship you, to honor you, and to glorify you, Lord, and to place your name above all names, Lord, even our own, as all of us fight to put you first in our lives, Lord. Thank you for getting us all here safely, Lord, and all your generous provisions that you provide to meet all our needs each and every day. Let us see you in everything, Lord. I'd like to say a special prayer for our people who aren't feeling well, our sister Susan, our brother George, Alana, Larry, Lou, and Sandy, that the Lord be with all of you, Lord, and heal them. Lord, you're the ultimate doctor, and we are praying for them always, Lord, for you to bring them back to us better and whole again and better than ever, Lord. I'm grateful for them. I pray for our great nation, America, Lord, that you keep your healing hands on it, Lord, and put good godly people in office, Lord, to strengthen our nation again and make it great the way it always was, Lord, through your principles and through your word, Father. And pray for the nation Israel, Lord, that you bring peace to that nation and stop the tyranny. And they accept Jesus as the Messiah so you can restore that nation and make them complete also. And we pray that Jesus comes back soon to help us and settle all accounts. And as always, let all this be led by your spirit this morning, Father, and not my flesh. And it's in Jesus' powerful name I pray. Amen and amen. All right, let's stand and worship the Lord.
He does so many great things for us. Amen. What a beautiful day. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. Beautiful church. Have a round of applause. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out this morning for a portion of God's word, especially for the, the mothers that tolerate us so well. And hang in there for us. The closest thing to God's love there is. As we will be celebrating them and the message will be for all the mothers this morning as they deserve all the honor they can get for sure. Absolutely. So how's everybody doing this morning, okay? All right, the Holy Spirit will be taking over as I go into these scriptures and I pray that the message goes beyond the four walls and your word, Lord, brings salvation to someone this morning, Lord, in need. As your message and your word always goes out there and does what it is supposed to do, Lord. And we're grateful and thankful for that. All right, let's start off in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. There is a blue card in the pew. If you want to help you get to the scriptures faster this morning. So we can move right on along here yeah, and get the clock started. Ephesians 6, verse 1. Children and parents. Children, obey your parents because you belong to the Lord. For this is the right thing to do. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with the promise. If you honor your father and mother, things will go well for you, and you will have a long life on the earth. That's a great promise there, isn't it? Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger by the way you treat them. Rather, bring them up with the discipline and instruction that comes from the Lord. Slaves and masters or employers and employees Obey your earthly masters with deep respect and fear. Serve them sincerely as you would serve Christ. Try to please them all the time, not just when they are watching. You, as slaves of Christ, do the will of God with all your heart. Work with enthusiasm as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will reward each one of us for the good we do, whether we are slaves or free. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Don't threaten them. Remember, you both have the same master in heaven, and he has no favorites. How about a big amen there? The Bible tells us as Christians, we're all equal in God's eyes. Whether you're an employer, employee, whatever you are, we're all equal in Jesus' eyes. Amen? I got one for us now. Go to Proverbs 31. Me sharing this awesome message on all you beautiful mothers out there this morning, as you deserve so much honor. Proverbs thirty one. Look at verse 25. She is clothed with strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. When she speaks, her words are wise, and she gives instructions with kindness. She carefully watches everything in her household and suffers nothing from laziness. Her children stand and bless her. Her husband praises her. There are many virtuous and capable women in the world, but you surpass them all. That's for you mothers this morning. I'm so grateful and thankful that you are here in our church. And I can't say enough about how I feel about the moms. So we're going to give this message on Mother's Day to all the mothers today because you deserve it. All over the world, okay, during Mother's Day, multitudes will gather in churches, homes, and restaurants to celebrate their mothers and their lives. Like other holiday seasons, 
million will be spent on flowers, candy, and gifts as they sincerely want to bless their mothers. However, many out of obligation or to quench any feelings of guilt will just send a card or perhaps give their mother a call on the telephone. Others will despise the thought of any such display told their mother and go on with their day just as any other day. Mother's Day is a time of recognizing and honoring the mothers in our lives. Birth mothers, stepmothers, mother-in-laws, grandmothers, and spiritual mothers. How many people will take into consideration all that the Lord says about honoring our mothers? Not only can we honor the grandmothers, mothers, and mother-in-laws, but it's important to also note the importance of spiritual mothers. Can I get an amen here? In a day and age when so many adults yearn for a connection with their mothers due to some unhealthy relationships that left many of them feeling unloved and unimportant in childhood or some growing up as motherless children. Spiritual mothers can often fill in the gaps and teach us the things we never learned in childhood. Our sense of self as a person evolves from our attachment and identification with our mothers, thus the importance of spiritual mothers in our lives. If you would turn with me to Psalm 139, please. Psalm 139, we're going to go to verse 13. You know, none of us would be here without our mothers, right? Thank you. Look at verse 13 of Psalm 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life, was recorded in your book. So God knew you before you were even born, when you were inside your mother's womb. Isn't that amazing? God used your mother as an instrument to craft you and make you into a son or a daughter. He used her to bring you into this world so that you could, in turn, bring glory to God. In your mother's womb, God knitted you together. This is such a beautiful picture of God's heart and his involvement in the very details of our lives. Our mothers deserve so much. They deserve our hearts, our love, and our appreciation. Whether you had a great experience in your upbringing or you came up in a broken home, God chose your mother to play a vital role in your life and bring you into this world. You are no accident. God's choice in your mom was no accident. God is sovereign. Our trust in that truth can bring healing and hope to our lives. I know as parents, we say that our children are gifts from God. In a similar respect, let's see our mothers as God's gifts to us. How about an amen there? They nurtured us cared for us, fed us, clothed us, changed us, bathed us, held us in our best moments, held us in our darkest moments. When we could do nothing, they did everything. Our mothers are truly gifts from God. 
Motherhood is one of the most, most essential roles in human history. As we honor moms today, it's important to remember that they fulfill a divine role when it comes to shaping children and teaching them about the Holy Spirit, the Bible, and God's work in our lives. Being a mother might be one of the hottest jobs on the planet. But thankfully, there are plenty of Bible verses about mother's love that reveal the glory of the job. What other position starts with nine months of carrying another human being, followed by at least 18 plus years of 24-7 availability? Despite this, no job is more rewarding. The Bible explains the power of God's love throughout its pages, but other verses can also shed light on this amazing gift of motherhood. If you would turn with me, please, to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Motherly love takes everything that you have, <laughs> that's for sure. As we're going to explain it in 1 Corinthians 13, look at verse 4. As Christians, this is the kind of love that Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit has put inside your heart. Whether you want to Live by that love is up to you. We also have a flesh that has conditional love. But this kind of love is unconditional. As Christians, this is the kind of love we should be showing to ourselves and to others. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. How about a big amen there? Now, this is the kind of unwavering love that mothers give. This is the closest thing to that love is the mother gives to her child. The closest experience. Even when it's hard, a mother's love will cause you to react in ways you never thought you would. Love is patient even when explaining the same thing for the hundredth time. <laughs> love is kind when family members are sick and can't care for themselves. Love doesn't want others what others have or promote itself. And it teaches children to do the same. Your mother's love seeks to bring honor, not dishonor, to your children and spouse. You bite your tongue when you know your temper is short and forgive an unlimited number of times. Remember when uh, Peter was telling you, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times? He thought he was being generous. No, Jesus says seven times 70. That's the kind of love, that, the forgiveness that the mother gives their child. Right? Always forgiving them. <laughs> there are many wonderful examples of good moms all around us. But we can also look at biblical mothers to see prime example of what it takes to raise children well. So let's explore some of the moms of the Bible this morning. Holy mothers and holy women who show us all the path forward. Be inspired by these biblical mothers. And many lessons they teach about faith, overcoming struggles, and trusting God amidst uncertainty. Let's look at the mother of Moses, Jochebed, sacrificing for her own son. The Bible tells us that Jochebed, Moses' mother, went above and beyond to save her little boy's life. At the time of Moses' birth, the Egyptian pharaoh demanded that midwives kill every Hebrew boy born in Egypt something done in an effort to control the Hebrew population. 
The Hebrew midwives refused to participate in the infanticide and deceived Pharaoh so they could avoid killing the baby boys. It tells us in Exodus. Moses' mother, Jacobed, hid Moses in a basket of bulrushes and sent him afloat on the Nile River to preserve his life. Even Pharaoh's own daughter disobeyed the decree when she found Moses in the basket and took pity on him, adopting him as her own, his own child, her own child. Moses was raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Jacobed made the sacrifice not only to ignore the king's mandate and hide her son for three months, but then selfishly release him so that he could survive and be cared for by the Pharaoh's daughter. In an amazing turn of events, Jacobed became Moses' nurse while Pharaoh's daughter raised him. Think about this. An effort that kept her connected to her beloved son. And Exodus 2.9 tells us that what happened after Pharaoh's daughter discovered Moses in the basket on the Nile and hired Jacobed to nurse the boy. If you would go with me please to Exodus chapter 2. Most of us remember that account, right? But just imagine that Moses' mother actually nursed the baby and even though it, she had to turn him over to Pharaoh's daughter just to save his life. That's the mother's love right there. That's ultimate sacrifice. Think about that. How much sacrifice a mother gives for the benefit of their child so the child could have a better life. Look at verse 9 of Exodus chapter 2. Take this baby and nurse him for me. The princess told the baby's mother, I will pay you for your help. You think she wanted money? Think she wanted to get paid for that? So the woman took her baby home and nursed him. Now listen to this. Later, when the boy was older, his mother brought him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him as her own son. The princess named him Moses. Moses sounds like a Hebrew term that means to lift out. For she explained, I lifted him out of the water. Just imagine that picture that she had to give her son, after she nursed him, back to Pharaoh's daughter. And look how God used that situation to raise Moses to set the nation Israel free. That's the importance of everybody that's born into this world. God has a plan and purpose for each and every one of them. How about a big amen there? Now, you think that Moses' mother thought it was going to happen that way? Absolutely not. That's why we have to understand the great mystery of God. He does things in ways that we're never going to understand. But let me tell you something. He knows the beginning to the end, and he knows what's best for you. He knows what's best for me, and he knows what's best for your children. And if we raise them up in a good godly home, in a good godly way, the Bible says that they will turn out well. How about a big amen there? And even if they wander, they always have something to fall back on and come back home to Jesus. It's an awesome thing. So let's talk about another mom of the Bible, Mary, Jesus' mother. Mary is without a doubt one of the most well-known and revered moms of the Bible. She's a prime example of biblical motherhood, and her story teaches us a great deal about following the Holy Spirit and living out God's work in our lives. The scriptures explain that God chose Mary to be Jesus' mother, granting her one of the most important and transformational roles in human history. The Virgin Mary's most stunning attribute was her devotion to God. This is apparent in the Gospels when it is revealed by an angel that she will be, that she will be with child. The Bible tells us in Luke that the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary and told her that she would give birth to Jesus. Mary had some questions about how the pregnancy was possible. Without doubt, no reason, of course. And she was troubled by the angel's message. Still, she committed to living out God's plan and said, I am the Lord's servant. 
The gospel account in the book of Luke is quite revealing. It shows the grace in which Mary took the shocking news that she would be Christ's mother. The angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, who was a virgin at the time and committed to be married to Joseph. Gabriel told Mary that she was highly favored and revealed that she would be expecting. Mary questioned how pregnancy was possible and was initially troubled by the angel's appearance. You can only imagine, right? But once she learned of the reason for Gabriel's visit, she responded to the life-changing news with the heart that was fully open to God's plan and to God's will. If you'll turn with me to Luke chapter 1, please. We're going to read this account. If you notice, everything that ever happens in the Bible was not, never planned and never thought through by the person themselves. They could never understand how God worked. They just had to have faith in him and trust in him that his ways were going to work out. When we try to think of this Christian walk in the intellect, we fail miserably and we give up because we think that doesn't make any sense. No, God does not make sense in the intellect because he's supernatural. You see, if you can never figure God out, that's why it's a faith and a trust walk. When you start to take matters into your own hand, that's just like you're being disobedient to God, saying, I know better than God who made me and he knows best for who I am and best for my will for my life. I can handle it. That's what the intellect tells us. That can't be real. You know, this spiritual stuff is kind of weird. God is spiritual. It's the Holy Spirit that comes into us. It's not understand, understandable or explainable. That's why it's a, faith, and it's a faith walk. We walk by faith, not by sight, or what we feel or what we see. We just trust that God's going to work it out, and he's going to get us through. How about a big amen here? Stop trying to figure God out because you're not going to be able to. You're going to be miserable. And don't think that God needs your help. He doesn't need your help. Look what it says in verse 29 of Luke chapter 1. A lot of people have trouble with spiritual things because they think they're smarter than God. All right, here's verse 29. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think of what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel, or over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I am a virgin. Just imagine now, just imagine what Mary was going through now. An angel visited her saying, you're going to conceive a son, it's going to be Jesus. And she's saying, but I'm a virgin, how can that happen? How in my mind can I picture me becoming pregnant and having a child if I'm a virgin? There's the intellect, right, trying to figure that out. But God says, no, it has nothing to do with you. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. Now look what it says. <laughs> How can this happen? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the baby will be born, will be whole, the baby to be born will be holy, and he will be called the Son of God. What's more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. People used to say she was barren, but she has conceived a son, and now in her sixth month. For the word of God will never fail. Do you see what it says? Do you believe that today, my brothers and sisters? Do you believe that the word of God will never fail? Or do you think that it does fail? This is a choice you have to make. God's not going to make you believe what he's telling you. He's telling you it's a choice. You have to believe what he says. And he says, if you live by my principles and by my way, I will never fail you. People will fail you. If you trust in people. 
over God or politics or all these other things that the world offers over God. Listen, that stuff's fake. Sinners can't fix sinners. You have to get that through your head. There's no person on this earth can, can fix this problem. That's why we need Jesus. And the, only, the best thing we do have is to have somebody Christian and godly that goes by the principles of the Bible to try to bring the America back the way it was by the principles of the Bible. Can I get an amen? Not by human reasoning. How about a big amen there? That's why I trust God. I don't get involved with all that stuff because the Bible says these things are going to happen. And it's only going to get worse. So that's why we have to what? Grow spiritually so we'll be able to handle it better. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. It's not going to get better and better and better if you understand the Bible. So we just have to be ready for when it does happen. That's why we have to grow spiritually so we don't get all frazzled when things really start to happen. Believe me, this country's in for a real rough ride. And we're trying to prepare, I'm trying to prepare you for what's coming. You have to understand what's coming. The more God you take out of the country, the more devil that comes in. You see, this is a spiritual thing. Not only does a spirit enter a person, a spirit enters a nation. And it starts a nation to what? Rebel against God. The whole nation, even in the church. We have to understand these things because it's a lack of understanding of the Bible and the lack of being taught the right stuff in the Bible in churches. Can I get a big amen here? And it's up to us and the mothers that the child, the children that are getting raised up now, to what? To, to turn to the Bible and the Bible principles instead of listening to TikTok and all this stuff that's going on out there. Because just think about what's getting raised out there. Not children of God. And unfortunately, parents are not letting, are letting that happen by not stopping it. Saying, listen, no, we're not, we're not going on TikTok. We're going in the Word of God tonight. As long as you live under my roof, this is what we go by. Can I get an amen here? It's time to take control back. Because the world wants, see, the devil wants us to lose control of the children so that they can become the children of the devil instead of the children of who? Jesus. Can I get an amen here? <clears throat> and that's what's happening. That's why it's important for the mother's role, no matter how old the child is. Okay. Now look what it says. <laughs> For, look what it says. She's in her sixth month. Look at verse 37. For the word of God will never fail, or some manuscripts read, for nothing is impossible with God. Look at how Mary responded. I am the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And then the angel left her. So what did Mary, after fig, trying to figure it all out, she said, whatever. I'm yours. I'm the Lord's servant. May everything you have said about me come true. And the angel left her. So Mary what? Trusted God. When it comes to biblical motherhood, Mary's reaction teaches us all about how we should consider God's calling over all of our lives. He's calling all of us. We're going to talk about another great mom. Her name is Naomi. The encourager. Naomi's powerful story is told in the book of Ruth. And it's a harrowing ordeal. She's one of the moms of the Bible who suffered a great loss. Okay? You might recall that Naomi and her husband and sons moved from Bethlehem to Moab when the famine hit. But then her husband and sons die, leaving behind Naomi and her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Oprah. Eventually, Naomi decided to return home and Ruth goes with her out with her devotion and love, showing the power that can come from strong familial relationships. The book of Ruth is essentially a story of Naomi's transformation from despair to happiness through the selflessness God blessed acts of Ruth and Boaz. Though it also teaches many lessons about biblical motherhood, Naomi remained devoted to her daughter-in-law and is one of the holy women in the Bible that provides a wonderful example of parental guidance and love. Ruth eventually marries a man named Boaz, and Naomi is restored in her contentment again. Go with me to Ruth chapter 4, please. 
So you may say, why do I need to read the Bible? Why is it just filled with a bunch of stories? It's not filled with a bunch of stories. It's filled with a bunch of examples on how trusting God will get you through anything. And, and what? Disobeying him will cause you, get you into a lot of trouble. It's there for our example. That's why I can't stress enough to read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Because it teaches us everything about life and how to handle life on life's terms. Can I get an amen, believers? How do you expect to know God without knowing the Bible? A lot of us question, how could God do this? And why would God do that? Well, if you read the Bible, it would answer every question you would ask. He tells you why he does what he does. He does it for ultimate good and not for evil. Look at Ruth chapter 4. Verse 13. That's why when you try to figure God out, you'll be spinning your head. So how could that work out for good? Because our intellect it thinks a certain way because it's been taught a certain way. But the word of God teaches us a different way, a spiritual way to understand there's something behind every event and every action that happens in human history. There's something tied behind it that we can't see. And that's why we displace it. Oh, that can't happen. That's why science tries to displace it. They figure, well, they can't figure it out. Because it's spiritual in nature. The Bible says you can't figure out spiritual things unless you're a spiritual person. See, a person who's not spiritual can't understand spiritual things. So that tells you that you don't have the Holy Spirit if you can't understand spiritual things. Can I get an amen here? Very simple. It's spiritual in its nature, and it always will be. There's a force beside, behind these things. It's the devil is behind people, places, and things, and he has minions that cause these things to happen because the devil is the god of this world. That's why when you follow the principles of the world, you're following the devil by default and don't even realize it. He's the great deceiver. How about a big amen there? See, we think we're following God when we're following the world, but we're not following the word. Take the L out and put the R in there. We need to follow the word of God, not the world. Look at, look at verse 13 of Ruth, chapter 4. So Boaz took Ruth into his home, and she became his wife. When he slept with her, the Lord enabled her to become pregnant, and she gave birth to a son. Then the woman of the town said to Naomi, Praise the Lord, who has now provided a redeemer for your family. May this child be famous in Israel. May he restore your youth and care for you in your old age. For he is the son of your daughter-in-law who loves you and has been better to you than seven sons. Naomi took the baby and cuddled him to her breast. And she cared for him as if it were her own. The neighbor woman said, Now at last, Naomi has a son again. And they named him Obed. It's a funny thing, I lived on Obed Avenue. It's crazy, I never knew what that word meant. I lived on Obed Avenue on Charles Street. I never knew what it meant. Now I know what it meant. He became the father of Jesse and the grandfather of David. Do you see how God worked? He worked through every adversity and unthinkable thing. Look what he did. He made Jacob the nation Israel. I mean, if you looked at the account, what he did, he stole his brother's birthright. He burnt people. He was a scoundrel. God transformed them into Israel. That's how powerful God can transform anybody. Anybody. No matter where we come from. He turned the scoundrel into the nation Israel. Just think about that. You can't do that in your own power. It's impossible. Now look what it says here. <laughs> the grandfather of King David. There's much to learn about trusting God and loving and caring for family members. Naomi is one of the holy women of the Bible worthy of deep, deep exploration. That's why it's always go back to read these accounts and see how God works. Listen, you want to understand how God works, you have to read the accounts not from, not from just one point of view, but through the whole picture. Obed became the grandfather of King David, Right? So you have to understand how it works. There's a, there's, everything in the Bible has a significant purpose. 
And when you read it and study it, it re- God reveals to you in the time of what that purpose is for your life. So we're going to look up another mom of the Bible, Sarah, Abraham's wife. Was Sarah perfect? None of them, if you understand, none of them were perfect. All of us are failures. You see, we never try to become Pharisees in church. We become to be what? Followers of the faith in church. We're not perfect, but we're getting perfected. We don't have to put on a church face like everything's going on and going good because we know there's a lot of struggles in this life as Christians. We have to understand that we don't have to come to church thinking that everything's going on. No, we come to church falling apart and God's putting us back together. We're in a hospital and he's healing us. So we just have to just relax and be yourself and say, listen, yeah, I fail and I fail often, but thank God for his grace and mercy to keep me afloat so I don't sink because I can't save myself. We have to understand the principles of the Bible. God loves us unconditionally. We're here. We could be real here. This is a real church. We're trying to heal from what? The choices and decisions we make in what? Sin. That's what destroys us slowly and steadily. It contaminates our life subtly. And we think we're getting away with something until what? Till the problem comes because of it. There's always a consequence to every action. That's why we could avoid a lot of them if we just study the Bible and ex- by the examples of the Bible. Can I get an amen here? All right. Sarah, also known as Sarai, was Abraham's wife. Sarah is one of the more interesting biblical mothers. <laughs> as she's among the moms in the Bible who was a mixed bag when it came to setting examples. How many mixed bags we got in here this morning? Let's be real. By no means was she always the perfect model of godly grace and meekness. But there are some truly interesting elements about her story that can teach us a valuable lesson. The importance of waiting. Okay? The importance of waiting. How many of us have trouble waiting on God? What was their mistake? Waiting on God. They didn't want to wait on God. Sarah and Abraham's story teaches us that God's work isn't dependent on our timing. Genesis describes Sarah as barren. At one point, she blames God and says he had kept her from having children. Then she encourages Abraham to have a child with her slave, Hagar. Just imagine how desperate she was for a child. Just think how desperate she was to have a child by giving her husband to another woman. In the end, Hagar gave birth to Ishmael. But Sarah, as God promised, became pregnant with Isaac. Both Sarah and Abraham laughed when God told them they would have a son as they were advanced and aged. God, to to follow through with his plan, go with me to Genesis chapter 18. Look at Genesis chapter 18. We're going to go to verse 13. Every time I read these accounts, I I can't try to figure out the way God works. I say, there's just no way I could ever understand how he's going to work the way he worked these things out. Look what it says in in verse 13 of Genesis 18. Then the Lord said to Abraham, <laughs> it's a little insider from the walk through the Bible. Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, Can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. 
But the Lord said, no, you did laugh. You can't get away with anything with God. You can't get away with it. She, she even lied to God. I didn't laugh. He said, oh, yeah, you did. How many times did we lie to God? Simon and Isaac proven that it was never too late for God to follow through with his promises. When we look at holy women and moms in the Bible, this theme rings true. And Sarah is one of the best examples. God promised them a child, but not in their time and not in their way. So they, what did they do? They try to interfere and help out God. Right? With Ishmael. Just imagine the problems that caused that household by them getting involved and not trusting God and waiting on him. How many times the Christians get into problems from not waiting on God and getting in and making our own plans and doing things to try to help out God? Can I get an amen here? You see how many mistakes we make? We all make many mistakes. We have to understand when we read the Bible, say, you know what? I can avoid that mistake if I just wait on the Lord. We live in a country that doesn't wait on anything. I wanted this. I want that. I want to go here. I want to go here. I want to do this and I want to do that. And I'm not waiting any longer. And then you just say, okay, God says, go ahead, do whatever you want. You have free will, but that's not my plan for you. So don't try to justify that it is. And then when it falls apart, God, why'd you let that happen? Why? Because we didn't wait on the Lord and we still blame him. Can I get any man here? Instead of looking in the mirror and saying, I was just too impatient. God said he would do things in his time and his way. I just didn't want to wait. It all happened in the garden, right? It wasn't me. It was the devil. He made me do it. We've been passing the buck ever since, haven't we? All right, the next one. How about Hannah? Does everybody remember Hannah? Maybe no. But Hannah is another one of the moms of the Bible who can teach us an important lesson about biblical motherhood. Now remember, before giving birth to Samuel, she pleaded with God to make her a mother. And he heard her prayers and answered. An inspiring quality from Hannah is her trust in God. Hannah's story presents numerous examples of biblical motherhood. We learn in 1 Samuel 1 of the pain she experienced in wanting a child. How many of us? But being unable to conceive, she was one of the two wives to Elkna, and Elkna's other wife, Peninnah, had children and taunted Hannah. See? They taunted her. Ah, we got kids, you don't. Go to Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 1. The human heart hasn't changed one bit, have you noticed? We're still full of pride, envy, jealousy, greed. I'll tell you one thing. I'm so glad I found Jesus. Because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't be standing here any, right now. And neither would any of you. Trust me, whether you realize it or not. You're not standing on your own two feet by your own will. It's God. Whether you want to recognize it or not, you will someday. 1 Samuel chapter 1, look at verse 11. And she made this vow. O oh Lord of heaven's army, if you will look upon my sorrow and answer my prayer and give me a son, then I will give him back to you. Then he will be yours for his entire lifetime, and as a sign he has been dedicated to the Lord, his hair will never be cut. Or some manuscripts read, he will never drink neither wine or intoxicants. So God answered Hannah's prayer with birth of Samuel. Remember the great prophet. But they had a what? She had to give Samuel to God. She did. And in prime example of biblical motherhood, she devoted her baby to God as she had promised. She also uttered a prayer worth noting. Here's a portion of it. Go to 1 Samuel. Go to chapter 2. 1 Samuel chapter 2. Look at the prayer she said. Hello?
I love this. Look at verse, First Samuel chapter 2, look at verse 1. Then Hannah prayed. My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. Now I have an answer for my enemies. I rejoice because you rescued me. No one is holy like the Lord. There is no one besides you. There is no rock like our God. How about a big amen there? They even made a song like that. There is no rock like our God. That's a song. You see what she said though? My heart rejoices in the Lord. The Lord has made me strong. She attributed everything that happened in her life to the Lord. You see, do we do that? Do we attribute everything that happens that's in our life to the Lord? Do we give him the glory? Do we give him the honor? Or do we take recognition and try to get the glory for it? Another thing we have to recognize as we celebrate Mother's Day and moms more generally, we can look to Hannah's example of turning to God in a time of need and trusting him. How many of us don't turn to God in our time of need? When we need him the most, we don't turn to him. Why? Because we think our intellect can fix something. It cannot fix a spiritual problem. You understand? Our intellect cannot fix a spiritual problem. That's why a spiritual problem needs a spiritual solution. That's why the whole goal of this church is to grow spiritually and start to see things God's way, not our way. We want to see things Yahweh, not our way. You understand? So this is what I'm trying to teach you, to understand. We have to stay in the spirit when we leave church and understand spiritual things when we're not in church. We have to understand spiritual things when we're in traffic, when we're on the road, and there's an explanation spiritually for everything that happens in our lives if we just trust it and obey it. But that's a process, and that's what God's grace and mercy is all about. When we fail and we wander from that, he gives us the grace, and he causes us more problems to get us back in line again. He doesn't want to have to do it that way. Because when we're getting blessed, we walk away from God. But when we're in pain and in trouble, we come back to him. So unfortunately, that's the way he has to do it. He's done it that way since the beginning of time. Can I get an amen here? All right, how about, let's talk about Eve. How about Eve? The biblical mothers, Eve, the first of the Bible's moms. Oh, boy. Eve is another of the moms of the Bible who can teach us a great deal about biblical motherhood and what it means to be holy women and men. She was the first woman God created and is thus one of the first figures discussed in the Bible. Listening to God, listen to me now, and abiding in his, by his plan is essential. Eve's story reminds us that there's a penalty when we do not listen and that following our own path can lead us on unintended journeys. Adam and Eve were instructed not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but they decided to disobey and faced the consequences. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. Let's go. It tells us how Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden because of their mistake. I'm going to leave you with this. Genesis 3, look at verse 21. And the Lord God made clothing from animal skins for Adam and his wife. Then the Lord God said, Look, the human beings have become like us, knowing both good and evil. What if they reach out, take fruit from the tree of life, and eat it? Then they will live forever. So the Lord God banished them from the Garden of Eden, and he sent Adam out to cultivate the ground from which he had been made. After sending them out, the Lord God stationed mighty cherubim to the east of the Garden of Eden, and he placed a flaming sword that flashed back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. 
because of that one mistake, okay, they had to what? Struggle for the rest of their life, and so have we been struggling all our lives because of that fall. So now it's up to us what? To recover from that and to what? understand that God's ways are always better than our ways, and if we listen and if we trust and obey him, things are going to work out well for us. Can I get an amen here? All right, I'm going to leave you with that. I'm going to call the ushers to come up. Thank you for letting me share that, and I want to say happy Mother's Day to everybody again. All right, Brittany's going to come up. We're going to stand, we're going to sing, and we're going to close. Thanks, Brett. That was beautiful. Brother Dave, you want to come up and close us?
First, I'd just like to wish all the women just a happy and blessed day. And guys, even though we might think that the women are a pain in the butt sometimes, <laughs> we know we love them and we need them, Lord, and we wouldn't be the men we are today without them. So, ladies, we appreciate everything that you do and, and done for us. Lord, we're just so grateful and thankful to have such uh, these amazing women who are so faithful to you, Lord. And we're so grateful and thankful for these messages that you give to Pastor, Lord. And for a pastor who's not afraid to preach the truth of your word exactly the way you intended, regardless of anyone that gets offended or convicted, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that we've grown enough, Lord, to be able to use those tough, convicting messages, Lord, not to become bitter, Lord, but to grow stronger in our walk with you, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that before we do or say anything, Lord, that we're always mindful that our actions now represent you and the way ministries and all that we do, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that you will lay on our hearts, Lord, and those who watch online, Lord, a desire to want to give back to the church, Lord, so we can continue to restore your beautiful house, Lord, and pass it can continue to get the truth of your word out there to all who seek it, Lord. And I just pray, Lord, that you continue to watch over this church and our families, Lord. And I pray, Lord, for those who are sick, Lord, that you might put your healing hands upon them, Lord. Comfort them, reassure them you never leave them nor forsake them, and it's with them always. And I pray all this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. That's right. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, everybody. Happy Mother's Day to all you awesome mothers. Have a great day until we meet again. God bless. Peace.